Welcome to the second part of the lecture on sustainability in metal and lithium manufacturing. We have discussed till now the introduction to sustainability, a brief introduction of what is life cycle impact analysis that we will take in detail in this lecture. First of all, we will see design quality and sustainability, sustainable design methodology for additive manufacturing, design guidelines and design rules to have a sustainable design. And less environmental impact than additive manufacturing and sustainability in industry for the cradle to grave or the complete life cycle analysis. To create a sustainable environment, what is the ability that our system has? It has to have alignment to the business strategy that the environment is the key. This we have seen, we are just recalling what we studied in the previous lecture. It recreates the concept of linear production. It improves the use of resources. It is an integrated and systematic approach. It is based upon team effort always. So it is an alternative for pollution prevention. Along with this, we need to create a culture that is society is always part of it. The three pillars of the sustainability that we discussed, the cost reduction, overall results, operation focus is there. So there are certain requirements that we have also seen that management support, the resources are required, it needs the implementers, the people who are going to employ this, it needs experts to direct and guide, the needs are to be prioritized that have see, we have seen in the lean and green business model that value engineering, that environmental value stream has to be taken care of, then it depends upon the technology access, the lean environment integration. So it may also suffer from environmental differences worldwide. It may suffer from cultural differences, but overall goal globally and locally has to be green and sustainable system. Now, if we try to see the benefits, education on lean tools, then standardized process for production, team building from the event, rollout to other sites, ease of capital using, and lean and green systems are obtained. Now, mass and energy flow analysis is very important to understand how our system is working. So, this is a system in which there are certain inputs which are coming, energy, water, chemicals, oils, right. These are if from the management viewpoint, we can have the three M's of management, man, money, material, right. What we are getting out are metallic waste contaminated waste, contaminated oils and effluents. Now this system is interacting with another system where flow analysis is going on that is still again consuming the same resources or similar kind of the resources and it is also producing a similar kind of the waste here. I am only talking about waste. These waste, uh, metallic, contaminated waste, oils, effluents are emissions. Then we have energy then we have new job design. So th this all comes out. So in between, when the transportation between these two systems also happen, there is consumption of another resource that is diesel and we also produce carbon dioxide. So what mass and flow energy analysis tries to study is how do two systems interact with each other and can we have these systems which are working together. So can we use the waste of one system as the resource of other system? So this is known as industrial symbiosis. So this is how we need to understand the systems keep on going. To understand this, how do the systems could help each other? Industrial symbiosis though is one of the methods or one of the concepts that could be instituted, but we need to understand in a broader concept, in a broader viewpoint, what is circular economy. Circular economy is a sustainable growth paradigm, paradigm that means it is a situation, design, a change that strives to revolutionize how societies create, manufacture, 
and consume goods and services. So emerging technologies are transforming global value chains. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, internet of things, bioelectrochemical engineering, sharing platforms, etc., play a crucial role in enabling a circular business model. In a circular business model, you could see along with the reuse, repair, recycling, the recycling sector is in itself also interacting with the design and manufacture. And the retailer, the consumers, all are just moving around the circular economy, are trying to connect to each other. So how does this connect with the sustainable engineering or sustainable development? Circular economy business models enhance sustainability by increasing efficiencies and reducing waste. That is, they drive more models in which we increase the efficiency and driving innovation by allowing new entrants in the market, increasing the information transparency across companies, enabling to shun the traditional material, traditional materials or traditional processes which are consuming more energy or which are non-biodegradable. So refuse, reform, reduce, reuse, recycle. We saw in the solar cyclic diagram that reuse, remanufacture, recycle were only the three resorts. Before even reusing, we could reform. Before even reforming, we could refuse to use the material or something that is detrimental, that is not having great uh, influence on the sustainability. So this is how it goes, acquisition of raw materials, then recycling of end of life treatment, that design, production uh, and retransformation, transformation and distribution, consumption use, reuse, repair, collection of the material. This is also very important. When we collect the material, sometimes the energy consumed or an energy that is instituted in collecting the material or putting the waste in the last stage, that is also higher. We'll see the comparison between the energy that is consumed in different kinds of the materials in additive manufacturing in the forthcoming slides. The five business models that the part of the circular economy are number one, circular supplies, number two, resource recovery, product life cycle extension, sharing platforms, and product as a service. In circular supplies, these supplies as far as possible are to be renewable, if not renewable, recyclable input, and no single use inputs are allowed. I will put it here, no single use. It is suggested in a circular economy. Right? Then resource recovery, that is reusing the waste material and try to minimize using the fresh material, that is resource recovery. Then product life extension. Life extension means repair, reuse, upgrade, resell, all these things comes in the product life extension. So we try to use the powder again, we try to use the material, we try to use the same plate over which the previous product or the previous components was developed, we clean that plate. So this is product life extension. The sharing the platform, that is a collective use. And when we try to put the multiple components into a single bed and try to produce that in a single go, can we have uh, in melted additive manufacturing, can we print multiple components in a single go, in a single print, which are of similar shapes? Generally, in subtractive manufacturing, the components which are of similar shapes, like all the circular components, all the holes, or all the rectilinear components, would be produced together using a similar kind of the CNC program. This is known as group technology. In additive manufacturing, we can produce a circular component, a complex carburetor system, a, an impeller, all in one bed. But this is how sharing the platform is more easy in metal additive manufacturing or additive manufacturing in general. So collective use, access, all these boost the usability of the system. And like the energy consumption maximum in the fluid deposition modeling is in the sintering process because it is a furnace. So furnace, if it is working in the full capacity, definitely the energy consumption would be divided by the number of the components. And the overall energy component, energy consumption per kg of the product produced would be minimized. This is how we try to use this. 
Now, product as a service is one of all the uh, models that circular economy can also suggest. That is, convert your product sales to service models where the product retains the ownership so that you can keep on providing the product time and again. Let us have a quick look on the design quality and sustainability. Design quality affects a product's longevity from a sustainable product perspective. A highly desirable project have long life and less negative impact on the environment. A well-designed product or well-designed object is more sustainable and have more value. That is the time we invest to optimize the topology, time we invest to design it is always beneficial to have more value in the terms of the greenness in the product. The design quality includes the product's technical quality, desirability, the joy of use that is the fit or the tolerances that we have provided. They are those to be exact according to the requirement, the user attachment, the designers may boost desirability by making it look better, by tailoring it to user needs exactly. So a highly desirable object has a longer life as it is said here. Now additive manufacturing of a titanium bottle opener as an example here if you could see this saved 90 percent of the material compared to a CNC machining because the material which was there in the subtractive manufacturing. So there is no material in between just having the proper optimized material only wherever the stress concentration is more it is designed accordingly. So it would have the similar strength similar performance as it could have been there with the CNC manufacturing component and we have saved 90 percent of the material. So this is additively manufactured titanium bottle opener. It was made out of titanium 64 utilizing selective laser melting SLS or SLM process to remove as much material as feasible while keeping mechanical properties intact. Sustainability of additive manufacturing beyond design freedom what do we have? It provides quantifiable sustainable benefits material use is one of those only. Other than this we have simple sieving operation that is most unmelted powder from the additive manufacturing can be reused compared to normal manufacturing the waste is minimal. So there is a general flow for the design of additive manufacturing. The whole design workflow can be divided into four major stages that is a functional stage, design optimization, design refinement, environmental effect evaluation. If I try to see these stages, so how does it go? So we have the specifications as the input. Right? This is a general flow or we have design requirements or specifications. These goes as an input to my manufacturing system or my design system. So where functional design is there, and we have physical entities which enter to the design optimization. design optimization. So which further provides that design refinement design refinement and then we have the diamond box which says that the safety of all functions is put or not. This is a general flow safety yes or no. Then we have the environmental impact evaluation, environmental impact evaluation. Now how does environmental impact evaluation is connected to this safety and after safety how does it also go? During the design optimization itself, the environmental impact has to give its inputs. So I put a dotted line that is a feedback has to be taken from the environmental impact. So arrow goes in the reverse direction. So this is 
the environmental impact estimation that goes or that is taken care into uh, the design phase only. Impact estimation, environmental impact estimation. Now, this gives us the output now that output is our optimal product design or the product involved. Uh, yes, two in outputs I could put here. One is the optimal product design and we have environmental impact, environmental impact data to have the environmental impact analysis and the optimal product design. So, this is a general design flow when we take into account in the framework the sustainable design. Now, next step in this is uh, how does this derive the design stage? A functional specification derive this design stage. The functional specification define a product's overall functions and input and output qualities. The designers can summarize the interaction between the developed items and external agents based upon the functional specification. When I say functional specification like for example, this bottle opener, the function was just to open the bottle, number one, primary function. Secondary function, it has to be held in the hand, so length has to be accordingly. Number three, the size has to be so designed, it has to be held ergonomically. For example, the size of the pen, it is generally the 10 mm width of the pen. Similarly, 10 mm by 10 mm square has to be there, so the outer edges has to be accordingly. So, these are the functions. The function of the material which is not there, that was not required. So, those are all taken off. Similarly, the function of a chair can be just to support the body. The sur top surface of the chair is only required. The basic supports, the cross that we have to collect the legs, those are all support functions to make to make sure that the load that is put on the chair, for example, 100 kg is supported. To support that 100 kg load, what else designs could be put? So, those are only taken care of while we design for sustainability. A generic black box model can be used to represent the input of the functional requirement. Next, we have the general black box for uh, the product functional specification to design for, for functional design stages. So, there could be different functional design stages model as well that could also be put that could only start from the functional decomposition, then function mapping, then building physical entities, then physical integration and then working on the physical entities only. That could also be one of the part. Next is design optimization for sustainability. Though we have discussed and studied design optimization at stretch in the previous lecture, still I would like to mention here that physical entities can be optimized to reduce environmental impact and improve product performance. Multi-scale additive manufacturing enabled design optimization methods consider the environmental impact models as pre-feedback. So, functional needs and manufacturing restrictions become design parameter constraints here. Additive manufacturing enables the design optimization approach and it can be selected to optimize the created physical entity on multiple design scales. For example, a traditional wrench or an optimized wrench. A traditional wrench you can see how the load, load is distributed and we have maximum this red area, so how the load is distributed around this net area only. In a optimized wrench, only at small points the load is distributed. So, this is how the function is to hold the nut to provide enough strength to the nut or the head of the nut or bolt. So, as we can rotate it, we can open it. So, traditional wrench is designed in this way. Optimized wrench has a design in which the strength of the material is more. So, even when this material, this portion if you see, if it is not even in the contact to the nut, but still it is facing equivalent force as it is faced at the contact points. These two are the contact points here, right. Even this area is having stream stress concentration here. So, this is a new design that could be used. Similarly, in this design itself, if suppose material is not required here, it could also be produced in the form of mesh right here a mesh could be produced. 
So, this is design optimization. In the design optimization, the pre feedback from environment is taken that acts as an impact input. This is how the workflow of optimization go. So, this goes as input and that determines the optimization objective in the flow chart. Then to determine the optimization constraints, the functional requirements and manufacturing constraints both play a major role and this is put in a dotted box because this is in itself a big system or big set of parameters play a role in it. Then multi-scale design optimization is taken place, then output design results give us the optimized physical entities. This is how the general workflow goes. Then design refinement is one of the steps always when we have gotten the design in the previous flow chart, we try to refine the design as well. So a design refinement procedure is needed to modify some optimized product design details due to the second design stages, coarse or irregular boundaries. Material is eliminated whether where relative density is below the threshold as we have seen in the example of the uh, bottle cap opener. In the environmental impact evaluation, there is a general flow that can be divided into three main steps as it is given here, the energy and material consumption analysis, the life cycle inventory, a life cycle impact analysis compilation. For that, we need to identify our goal and scope of the analysis or the assessment that we are going to do. We like need to understand the life cycle inventory of the component or the product under study, the impact assessment. This will only give the interpretation. So majorly, if I put a monofracturing system here, so it has inputs as material and energy. So this is a manufacturing system that takes the raw material, it uh, works on the system, it I would put steps here, I would put it designs, then uh, it goes for material preparation or I would say production, then we use and maintain and then the post processing, everything happens and we use or reuse again. Then we can also, I will put end of life, then the material is over. This is a system of the life of the product that is under study. In this, the output that would come that could be our indicator that has to be calculated which could be emissions, then we, it is the uh, warehouse waste that is a solid waste, then we have co-products, co-products or I could say by-products even that could be used by another industry, then other releases, any other releases such as the material, water wastage and so. So in this overall system, if suppose if I put it into a circle, the overall system, the boundary of the circle that would give me the life cycle impact analysis is given here. It would have energy and material consumption analysis. I call it life cycle assessment LCA as number one. Number two, the costing, the life cycle costing as number two. Number three, the sustainable life cycle assessment, which means the overall life cycle impact assessment is equal to the life cycle costing plus life cycle analysis or general life cycle assessment plus sustainable including that is the environmental life cycle assessment. There are models suggested by uh, some researchers, it was also given in the previous course on uh, sustainability in manufacturing systems. You can also have a look over it if you wish to go further deep in this. Now, 
the life cycle imp impact analysis provides additional information to access life cycle inventory. It helps users to better understand the environmental significance of the natural resource and environmental disease. So, this is how it helps. There are certain design guidelines and design rules which are to be taken care of when we are trying to design in additive manufacturing. So, use the advantages that are included in the RM processes that is rapid manufacturing processes or additive manufacturing processes. So, this is an interchangeable term here. Do not build the same parts design for conventional manufacturing processes. Do not consider traditional mechanical design principles. Reduce the number of parts in the assembly by intelligent integration of the functions. That is check whether there are bionic examples to fit your task, whether these give good hint toward better solutions. Then once you have good design freedom always, then we have a great design freedom in additive manufacturing. It is no longer difficult to produce big parts. Then we optimize the design towards higher strength and lowest weight. We use undercut, hollow structure, these are all useful. We should not think about tooling because this is no longer needed at all in additive manufacturing. So, if I suppose try to compare additive manufacturing with a subtractive one, I would like to put the energy consumption that is taken from a research by Liu et al. I will put the reference here Liu et all in 2018 and their research published in the Procedia manufacturing on energy consumption in additive manufacturing of metal parts gives this data that for machining and for the additive manufacturing, a machining is my subtractive manufacturing. I put one additive manufacturing process that is that is taken by the study is the electron beam manufacturing. So, this is subtractive manufacturing, this is additive manufacturing and the steps in developing a product and the parameters that they have taken that is the final part. The weight of the final part is first parameter in kg in machining was 1.09 and for the electron beam process you could see the wastage of the material is minimum and overall component that is produced is also of around one third of the weight of the part that is produced in the conventional manufacturing. Number one, the material that is removed. So, generally uh, material becomes half of the size that we get the original in got. So, the final part that we have got is of 1.09 kgs and here in EBM it is 0 0.38 kgs only. So, let us also see that they have given the in got that they have taken the weight of that how they have given it here. The more shocking data we will have when we see the weight of the raw material. This is one third of the output product that we have got around one third of this. But the input material that is the ingot consumed, ingot consumed again in kg, it was 8.72 kgs in machining and 0 0.57 kg only in electron beam processes that is additive manufacturing. Now, the weight is reduced in the terms of material that we saw it majorly two inputs here, material and energy from the material viewpoint, this wins, additive manufacturing wins here. It is about 20 times the weight of the additive manufacturing that subtractive manufacturing is consuming. Now, let us have a comparison on the energy consumed in developing the raw material. In the raw material extraction, there is energy embodied in it to how to ex when we extract the material, we try to material. So, this is also put, it is going to be definitely proportional to the, uh, the weight of the material. So, in the raw material, I have put energy in megajoules, it is given as 8003 megajoules of energy and 525 megajoules in subtractive entity manufacturing respectively. Then we have the manufacturing energy, the energy consumed in the manufacturing. This is also in megajoules. In subtractive manufacturing, it is given as 952. In additive, it is 
115 megajoules respectively. Then in transport and use phase, the energies are given for the component or the product they have studied. So, in the transport itself, it is 41, this one is 14. In the use phase, it is showing 217949, and this one it is showing 76937. To see the overall energy consumption in the additive manufacturing that is studied by Liu et al. in 2018 is far less than the counterpart produced in the subtractive manufacturing. This finishes the second part on the lecture series on sustainability in metal additive manufacturing. I will talk about the life cycle stages in the third part. Thank you.